Good afternoon. I'm Liz Schreyer. I'm president and CEO of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, and I want to welcome our friends literally across the country. Now, I'm zooming in from my town where policymakers seem to not be agreeing on very much these days, but I'm really pleased that we're hosting an event where we're going to focus on where we do agree. We're going to focus on the bipartisan consensus. Now, today, we're really pleased to launch the USGLC's 2021 Report on Reports, a roadmap to US global leadership. So you're probably wondering, what is this Report on Reports? So it actually dates back to 2008. So I was sitting in my office and I was getting mailed to me these reports from think tanks and policy organizations that were piling up literally on my desk. They were recommendations, terrific ones, from going to the next incoming Congress and the administration on foreign policy and national security. And frankly, I was having trouble keeping up with these great reports to read them. And I was imagining how hard it would be for the incoming policymakers to also be able to have time to read all of them. So I thought, could we synthesize them? Yes, of course, there would be disagreements, but I wondered if we could find the common ground, the common thread in these reports and do a report on the reports, providing a roadmap for policymakers to show where there was agreement, particularly through the lens of diplomacy and development in our national security. So the, we launched Report on Reports. And I have to say that over the years, it's really been quite impressive where policymakers picked up on those consensus items. Now, every four years, of course, reports reflect the unique moments in the time. And 2021, the report is unlike any other, because of course, it's against the backdrop of the global pandemic, which is an incredible reminder that we all know that what happens globally literally impacts every one of our day-to-day -day lives in terms of our health, our safety, our economic interests. And today it's punctuated even more that this year's launch coincides with International Women's Day. It's, I think, a profound example of the progress that so many of you have been a part of over the decades, but also a heartbreaking reality of the disproportionate impact the global crisis has had on women and girls. And we're gonna talk about it in our first conversation. But first, just a few words about this year's report. I wanna give a shout out to my colleague, uh, John Glenn and his team, who were the authors of the report and literally read 120 of these fabulous reports. They're all US-based think tanks and policy institutes from across a wide political spectrum. They were all written before the US elections, meaning they didn't know who would win, they're not weighted to one side or another, but they're oriented of recommendations to both Capitol Hill and the administration. We organized them around six, a lens of six global challenges, obviously the global pandemic, growing uh, the global economic competition, mitigating against the impact of climate change, dealing with rising authoritarianism, responding to the global humanitarian crisis, and then engaging in how we engage our global partnerships. Of course, there's differences. But what we were struck with in all the years I've done this about how much there was that people agreed with, that there's a clear consensus that if we use our diplomacy and our development tools to tackle these global challenges that are critical to America's interests and deliver for America, that there's a lot that we can do. Now, you're going to have to read the full story. It's not long. It's only you know, less than about 15 pages. And you can find it on our website at usglc.org backslash roadmap. And let, one last point before we get into the details of this is consensus doesn't mean it's easy. To find enduring solutions requires obviously bipartisan leadership from both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. But we know it's possible. Over the last decade, over 50 bills signed, were signed into law with bipartisan support on a whole range of issues that we found in these reports over the years. Things like in HIV AIDS, in energy, food security, empowering women, development finance, fragility, and much more impressive results for the American people. 
So today we're really pleased to present our 2021 report. Ideas that were originated from lots of people across, as I said, the political spectrum. Shining a spotlight on the consensus that we hope is a jumping off point, a resource for how diplomacy and development can tackle some of the big global challenges and to deliver for the health and economic recovery for every American family. We're really honored today to be joined by President uh, Biden's National Security Advisor, Advisor, Jake Sullivan. But to start our conversation, we're gonna talk to some leaders of Main Street USA. And I wanna welcome an important partner for us, Carmen Villar of Merck, who's gonna kick us off to introduce our panel as in celebration of International Women's Day. Carmen? Thanks, Liz, and hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here on this great day and the release of your report on reports. I was just mentioning to Liz earlier today that I love this report because it brings it all together for me in a way that I can quickly read and understand. And it's such a great service that USGLC does for everybody in the global world. So thank you for that. On behalf of Merck, I just want to say that we continue to be committed to playing an important role in the discovery and development of novel medicines and vaccines, and very consistent with what we see in the report on reports in terms of the power of partnerships. Last week, uh, it was announced by President Biden that Merck entered into a historic collaboration with Johnson & Johnson to support the manufacturing and enable the supply of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. We're really happy about this partnership and that we'll be producing, formulating, and filling the J&J &J vaccine. On this International Women's Day, I also wanted to speak briefly about our longstanding commitment to addressing the healthcare needs of women around the world. Partnerships for impact matter. And this is why we are a proud partner with PEPFAR, the Bush Institute, and UNAIDS on Go Further, a partnership to address cervical cancer and HIV positive women in Sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> This is one of the populations most heavily impacted by cervical cancer. We are proud of this partnership and we have provided over 1 million screening, cervical cancer screenings to HIV positive women. I just quickly want to also mention Merck for Mothers. This is uh, our longstanding or 10 year uh, initiative working to address the health inequities around maternal mortality in the world as we believe no woman should die at giving birth. I've learned many, many years working at CDC in my previous life that no one can manage today's health threats alone. It is critical to partner, not just across sectors as we do here uh, in public-private partnerships, but also within all levels of government. It's my pleasure to welcome a terrific panel of leaders who understand the global, local connection we're making and that we need to continue to make. So we're going to have Steve Benjamin, our mayor of Columbia, South Carolina, and co-chair of the USGLC board. We're also welcome, welcoming former Oklahoma governor and Congresswoman Mary Fallon, and Michelle Nunn, CEO of the International Humanitarian Aid Agency CARE, based in Atlanta, Georgia, my former hometown. The report on reports shines a spotlight on how to actually get things done which is what mayors and governors and humanitarian agencies like CARE do every single day. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'd like to ask USGLC board member and former Congressman Pete Roskam to moderate the conversation. Over to you. Carmen, thank you very much. And it's a joy to be with you and with everybody else on this discussion. And, and as Liz said, this is translating a massive body of work through a USGLC lens that is essentially translating an international conversation. And now for our discussion, we're really kind of focusing in on Main Street and what, what's the impact, state and local. And there's, there's uh, nobody better to do that than a local mayor. So Mayor Benjamin, um, First question goes to you, and that is, as, as you've digested this report, there's one of the issues is climate change and the growing consensus about <clears throat> the needs to look at this from an international point of view and particularly building out 
resiliency in um, foreign countries as it relates to mitigation against famine and migration crises. How does this translate to you in Colombia and trying to, to lead there on a local effort, local level? And, and what's the impact that you've seen, Mayor? Well, first of all, thank you, Congressman. I'm not sure how I fielded the first question on International Women's Day, but I'll, but I'll take it nonetheless. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to be on, on, on this panel with these two amazing leaders. Uh, you know, the silver lining of, of the pandemic is indeed, it, I think it illustrated uh, what all of us in this panel have known, is that we are we are interdependent and interconnected, uh, unlike any time we've been probably in, in human history. And the reality is that uh, we, we felt that very real, in a very real way back in 2015. We had our, a, a 1,000 year flood here uh, uh, in, in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, over uh, about two weeks, we saw 11 trillion gallons of water fall on the uh, Carolinas. Uh, we had 45 dams uh, pop. We had 541 roads uh, destroyed. We had uh, 19 precious lives uh, lost here in, in Columbia. And it, it spurred us into action uh, to pass unanimously on our council a, a very first green bond, first stand, standalone stormwater green bond uh, to, to, to uh, deal with infrastructure issues in our city. We did it unanimously uh, on our council, uh, which, is, which doesn't happen a whole lot. Bipartisan, thoughtful approach, the same way that USGLC uh, does it. We did that in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, but it's so important to realize that the issues that people are dealing with all across the globe are so much deeper. Uh, so much uh, more pernicious, as, as your question suggests, and in trying to make sure that we're doing all we can across party lines, ensure that every community uh, across the globe has the same type of ability to respond uh, to these pressing uh, existential threats is a real challenge before us, and, and we need to continue to lead together. You know, I think it's so interesting because it's you, you do kind of get a sense that this is a bit of a a bit of a tipping point right now in terms of the country and different approaches and different attitudes about how we got here and the various uh, dimensions of impact. But it does suggest that there, there is a tipping point. So let me turn now to, to Governor Fallon. Governor, it's great to see you today. And um, you run a, a big, complicated, interesting state with a lot going on. You've seen firsthand in terms of job growth and economic development and other efforts around the world. One of the things that this report on report suggests is that we've got to up our game as a country from a competitiveness point of view, competing with other worldviews, competing in particular with China, which has a, a, a different, different view of things. What's your suggestion based on the years that you served in the House and based on your years that you led Oklahoma, what should we be thinking about on Main Street about upping our game competitively to compete with China? Well, first of all, Congressman, it's great to see you again. I miss <laughs> serving with you, but, but I'm also happy to be back in Oklahoma. Well, you know, I, I think we've all learned a lot about ourselves, about our businesses, about how to communicate, how to have relationships, how important government regulations, rules, taxes, competitiveness, and especially in a time of COVID when the whole world felt the effect of being shut down, shut in, uh, the, the lifestyles, the, the way people work. In fact, there's a great story on the national news today about women and working and certainly about international women and how do moms and women work from home when they've been so such a big part of the workforce and, and retail and hospitality and other trades that a lot of women work in. It also showed that a lot of women have been laid off during COVID and are now having to balance between work and family and education and how do you stay connected to people and how do you not lose your place on the career ladder if that's what you're pursuing at the time. So as far as being competitive, I, I think it's telling the story. How do we make it relatable to our, to our American families, to our Oklahoma families, and that we, we talk about the issues that are pressing to American families. And especially when it comes to being in a global economy and competing against countries like China they have such a big portion of the, of the trade market. How do you keep your business sustainable during a time of COVID when things have changed so dramatically? And I think having that conversation, making sure that both sides, and, and I think both sides do, talk about the issue. And I'm talking about all political parties, all makes of organizations. and 
talking to the American people that we understand here's the challenges that you face and we want to make sure that we have fair trade practices, that we have fair rules, regulations, fair taxes, that we are listening, that those who may be in public service or some part of an organization are listening to the small businesses, to the bigger businesses that may have a large portion of the, of the world market share. And how do we help people get back in the workforce, stay engaged in it, and unify as a country that we're all in this together, no matter what political party that you're in. I think it's really been highlighted during the COVID crisis, not only here in America, but across the world. Mm -hmm. I think that's your, your observation and your touch point of, of you know, looking at things from a state level and then a national level and the impact uh, internationally is, is incredibly significant. So, Michelle, question for you. Let's build on um, Governor Fallon's observation and sort of open the aperture on the lens and give us a sense of what what's happening and where are the where are the risks right now, particularly as it relates to women and girls? There's a level of vulnerability. Governor Fallon just articulated how many women have been in the workplace and so forth. And now there's a danger of um, their their being disproportionately negatively impacted by the fallout of the COVID pandemic, lack of resources and so forth. Can you give us a sense of what you're seeing on an international level, Michelle? Yeah, so, and I think an appropriate question on International Women's Day for us to mark uh, what the devastating impacts of this um, of this global pandemic have been on women and girls. Um, and we can certainly see it and the governor well articulated it here at home but those uh, have also impacted women and girls around the world. And I think as we look at what we need to do, what US leadership uh, is required in order for us to, to move through this crisis, I think we need to both attend to the needs of women and girls and also to ensure that we're putting them on the, uh, around the leadership tables that will enable us to, uh, to really navigate this crisis. So if you look at sort of what has happened to women and girls, those who are, already vulnerable and marginalized are those that have been most impacted by the pandemic. Again, we see that here at home uh, with communities of color as an example. We see that around the world with women and girls. Uh, we see that they have lost their livelihoods at greater rates in Bangladesh as an example, uh, six times more likely to lose their paid working hours than men. Um, we have seen that they are uh, often the ones that are going hungry and that are most concerned about hunger for their families. And we also see that they are suffering disproportionately because of the burdens of care that they're already responsible for. So imagine with a billion plus of our children that are out of school, um, what that means for women around the world, for mothers around the world. Um, we also know that, uh, that we really have to ensure that we are looking at the, the, the secondary and tertiary uh, kind of dimensions of the pandemic. So for instance, we estimate that for every month of quarantine that con continues, five million more women suffer from gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. We know that more girls are entering into child marriages. Uh, we know that um, millions of girls are, are actually losing the opportunity of being in school and they're less likely to be able to return to school. So all of that I think gives us the responsibility to ensure that we are putting gender equality fundamentally into the building blocks um, as we address COVID, but also as we build back stronger. And the good news is when we do uh, ensure that women are leading, when we ensure that we're taking into account that they're 70 to 80 percent of the caregiving workforce, they're going to be vaccinating people around the world, we can have and will have a better response. And I would just I would close by saying that on a on a note of hope and optimism that the um, the Biden administration's announcement today about the Gender Equity Council is exactly the kind of uh, leadership that I think that we need to be putting in place to ensure that this pandemic does not erase the gains that we've made around gender equality. And in fact, it propels us to excel gender equality. Good. Thanks, Michelle. So let's, let's um, just to close out our, our, our time, I think it would be really interesting to hear from each of you. And Mayor, I'm coming to you first. Let's just go in the order. So uh, the hang time on my question, I'll give you a, a second to think about it. But <clears throat> we're coming off uh, a pandemic. We're coming off an incredibly complicated election with everybody is, uh, was, was 
really anxious and, and let's just, it's a technical term, but a lot of uptight people. And um, you're, the three of you are political animals in one sense or another. And what message would you have to policymakers these days who have political bases to worry about? They've got this, that, and the other thing to sort of sort out. What message would you have for them in this season, Mayor? Let's start with you for how to, how to get things done in a complicated environment. What guidance would you have, Mayor? Sure. Well, I'd encourage uh, every single uh, elected official, particularly those in the federal level, to read this report. I mean, the report uh, is pretty uh, telling. And it shows that uh, the challenges that we face here are challenges that affect everyone all around the, uh, around the globe. I mean, some of the uh, polling shows, obviously, significant support amongst Republicans and Democrats uh, for, for federal aid and understand uh, for, for those abroad, understanding the way it impacts our lives on a daily basis. In, in, our, in our state, you might not think of a little South Carolina. Um, we, we have more European uh, foreign direct investment per capita uh, than any um, uh, state in, in, in the country, uh, which shows us that we're directly connected uh, to others around the world. Uh, it's, it's, it's important for us to realize that if we focus on issues of common humanity uh, uh, that are important to people uh, literally in, on every uh, continent of the globe, then it's amazing how we can move uh, all of us together forward. Republicans support this, Democrats support it. I would encourage uh, our elected officials to, dig, to do a deep dive into this report. And I think we'll find a whole lot more common ground that moves us all uh, forward together. That's what we do on the local level. We, we don't, we, we're, we're D's and R's and I's and, and some people who eschew any type of political affiliation, but who just believe in getting things done and getting things done uh, for, for, for every one of our families. Makes sense. Governor, what do you think? Based on your experience, you, you know, when you were in the House, you came in in 2006, it was a pretty uh, tumultuous year back then, and then you went on to serve in the, the governor's mansion and led, uh, led a, a big state. What, do you, what guidance would you have in this season for policymakers? Well, Congressman, you know, I've, over my political years, I've been in both the minority and the majority. I've, I've switched back and forth many, many times during those 28 years I was in public service. So I, I think the biggest thing is to listen to people, take it serious what they're saying, listen to your heart as a public official, gather as much information as possible, look at good reports like what this organization has just put together. I mean, it is a, a stellar report of people who are very, very credible. And the mayor said it right. You know, you, you look at who supports the, the issues that are in this report as far as what's important to the American people, you find there is a lot of commonality between all the political parties. And so it's important to move forward, to show people you will take these things seriously. And I'll never forget when I was a young legislator, I'm a person of the Democrat party and I'm Republican, came up to me one time, he says, you know, young lady, and I was in my thirties, he says, you can be successful if you don't care who gets the credit, mm -hmm. just get the job done. And so I, I think, People want, voters want us to get the job done. You know, people care about their pocketbook issues. They care about their businesses surviving. They care about their quality of life. They care about, you know, food security. They, I think most people do care about the poor and, and those who are not able to, to take care of themselves the way they want to. They care about their health. And certainly COVID has really pointed that out to us. We're all worried about our family's health, our coworkers' health, our businesses' health. And these are issues that spread across all political lines. And so hopefully Congress will be able to work together in a more congenial way. I know in the past it was more congenial. It's become a lot more partisan over the decades, but it's for the safety of our own well-being that we have to do these things and find a way forward with common issues and working together. And this report will really help. Michelle, you've been around politics your whole life. What what advice would you have for policymakers in this season in particular? Yeah, well, I had a father who served in the Senate for 24 years, and he says often that he never passed a meaningful piece of legislation without Republican partnership. So and he, as a Democrat, um, he always, I think, taught me that we have to find uh, ways of uniting, of building upon some common ground. And I would just, I think, be giving advice to our policymakers, let's, let's use this critical crisis, this opportunity for us to, uh, to, to lead with some aspiration and some idealism and, um, 
and let's call upon some of our common values. The governor, I think, uh, well articulated that people can agree that we should and should prioritize saving lives, um, that we should prioritize what's economically advantageous, not only to us, but to uh, the world and to our own national security by thinking about our interdependence and uh, ensuring that America is leading again in the world. Um, and certainly if, if nothing else, the global pandemic does teach us that none of us are safe until all of us are safe. And so um, I'm attending to Dr. Fauci's admonition that his biggest concern right now is that we don't globally coordinate around a vaccine. Uh, so um, I think we have a lot of work to do, but I also think there's an opportunity for coming together. I think those are great insights. Uh, just as a point of personal privilege, I. I've always told people who are getting active in politics for the first time, um, let your opponent take a victory lap on some issue. Just let them take credit for something. And then the second thing is be willing to take yes for an answer. Sometimes we have this oppositional thing going on in our country where because one party agrees to it, all of a sudden it becomes, oh, I can't say yes because they've agreed to it, which is just an absurdity. And um, then the third is just a quote, it, it goes to Thomas Jefferson, who everybody loves. So interesting to me, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter in 1790, and this is um, on the theme of incremental change. And he said, the ground of liberty is to be gained by inches. We must be content with what we can get from time to time and eternally press forward for what is yet to get. It takes time to persuade men even to do it, what is for their own good, which tells me take a small step and a small step and a small step. And then over a period of time, um, you, you, you've got something done. So speaking of time, ours is short. Liz Schreier is uh, back. And um, I want to just say thank you to our panelists for really good insight in um, uh, difficult, difficult questions and um, to tease out where the opportunities are and for the brightness that it is uh, that we have as Americans in particular to have a disproportionately significant impact on the globe today. So Mayor, let me turn it back to you for a continuation of our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congressman and, and our, our incredible panel. Um, really excited to welcome Jake Sullivan, President Biden's National Security Advisor to join us for the re release of USGLC's report on reports. Uh, Jake's a longtime friend uh, to the USGLC, pleased for him and for this country to see him in his new role, as we benefited many times from his insight on America's role in the world. He previously served as Director of Policy Planning on, at the, the State Department under Secretary Clinton and as National Security Advisor for then Vice President Joe Biden. For the past few years, he's been a fellow at Yale and at Dartmouth and led Carnegie, Carnegie, Carnegie's project on making US foreign policy work better for the middle class. Jake, thanks so much for joining us today. Mayor, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's always good to be among friends and to have the chance to talk about this important set of issues. So, so really, thanks for giving me the time. Well, welcome, Jake. I get the honor to share this conversation and it's just wonderful to have you join us to discuss a number of global challenges and pathways forward. And Jake, as you know, today we launched the USGLC's 2021 Report on Reports, which is actually a review of 120 reports from think tanks across a wide array of political spectrum. They were all written ahead of the election, so they didn't know who would win. So it's recommendations both for the new administration and to Congress. We looked through a lens of six big global challenges. There are a lot of differences, but you will not be surprised that how much consensus exists of recommendations to strengthen the tools of development and diplomacy, and really that these are, to follow them are the success in addressing these challenges to deliver for the American family. And I have to say, I was really struck after reading the Biden administration's interim strategic guidance, how much synergy there is. And we're very hopeful that this roadmap will be not only a resource for, for you, but also our friends of Cap on Capitol Hill and a promise for some bipartisan progress. So we hope this will be a jumping off point for our conversation. Um, so let me start. And I'm gonna start where the last conversation uh, ended, which it was a Main Street panel, the mayor, governor, and really looking at, as you know, Jake, the USGLC DNA. Leaders from across the country, which talk all the time about how leading globally matters locally. 
you and the president have called for putting the middle class at the center of our foreign policy and how global economic competition impacts every day the lives of America. So I'd love you to, before we get into the, the global uh, uh, challenges, the six ones that we talked about, how do you see uh, engagement in the world, particularly use, utilizing diplomacy and development, these tools of first resort, as you have called them, directly benefiting American families, Jake? Well, Liz, first of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity. It's really good to see you. Uh, the report on reports is just a great product. I, I've learned a lot looking through it in preparation for today. And like you said, there's a lot of consonance between the themes and the priorities reflected in that report uh, and what's contained in the president's interim strategic guidance, which we put out last week uh, to provide not just a broad vision for the public, but real practical uh, guidance for departments and agencies as they make decisions about allocating resources and setting priorities. So I, I guess I would just say two or three things in, in response to your question. The first is that we're at a moment right now with COVID-19 where American working families are experiencing, and in many cases tragically, firsthand, the impact of our interconnected world. Uh, a virus from a town that basically no one in the US had heard of before uh, in China, has now caused more than half a million deaths in our country, uh, has caused an economic crisis, and has reinforced the notion that we have to be operating in a cooperative fashion with the rest of the world to meet common challenges that affect people in their homes and their communities. And whether that's pandemic disease or it's the ravages of climate change or on the economic front, it is the question of how we ensure the resilience of our supply chains uh, so that we're not dependent on any one country, but that we have the capacity, both here at home with our own industrial base, but also working with allies and partners to be able to source the critical materials we need to respond to any crisis, whether it's a health crisis, or it's to have the batteries we need for electric vehicles, or the rare earth minerals we need for, uh, for our defense. So uh, this moment in particular is one where if we recognize our interconnectedness with the rest of the world, if we see that diplomacy and development are not about just doing good, uh, but they're about America doing well um, uh, in all respects, then I think we can turn what has been just an immense set of overlapping crises here into opportunities to, I guess, um, to coin a phrase, build back better. Uh, thank you. Let, let me drill down to some of the specifics that were raised that we saw in these reports. Not surprising, every report tackled the global pandemic. There were a lot of references to Ebola. Once the disease was under control, the urgency phase that we, the collective we, didn't build the bipartisan support for investing in global health security. And where there was great deal of consensus, is on this imperative, you just addressed it a little bit, but on the imperative of supporting investments in two particular areas, pandemic preparedness and in investing in health systems in the developing world that don't have the resources to respond. So as we are with um, in, in the midst underway with the global vaccine campaign, what are your thoughts about ensuring that we don't take our foot off the pedal this time? and instead really build the commitment in the global health agenda and ensure America is at the forefront in our global role? Well, first Liz, just recognizing um, how urgent this challenge is. Uh, you, you mentioned us sort of beating one Ebola epidemic in 2014, 2015. We now have cases of Ebola in both the DRC and in Guinea right now. Now, it hasn't reached the levels uh, that we saw back a few years ago, but it is a stark reminder that that disease, too, uh, could represent a threat to a broader set of countries in Africa and to the world and ultimately to the United States if we don't stay on the front foot. And then secondly, we're watching COVID-19 evolve with variants uh, that spread faster, that are more lethal, and it too is a reminder that even if we can turn the corner on COVID-19 over the course of the next year, 
the possibility of another coronavirus uh, or an evolved version of the coronavirus could um, pose a threat uh, to the United States and to the rest of the world uh, next year, the year after, the year after that. These are real things and they require not a, a strategy for five or 10 years from now, but a strategy beginning today to get disease surveillance in place globally so that we have a better sense of where outbreaks are occurring, to strengthen health systems, as you just mentioned, in every country in the world so that countries are more resilient and capable of treating uh, epidemics in outbreaks at the source so that they don't spread and become global pandemics. Uh, and also to creating a circumstance in which we can make sure that we are sharing information, sharing supplies, sharing vaccines across the board um, because we are all in the same boat on this. And one practical step that the United States is taking is that we've made a commitment of $4 billion to what's called COVAX, a facility to help finance vaccines globally. And we split it into two tranches. One tranche, we put forward two billion uh, just to get vaccines out the door. The other two billion, we are seeking to leverage contribution, contributions from countries around the world, not just for straightforward vaccine delivery, but vaccine delivery in the context of building up the strength and capacity of health systems. So that even as we're responding to COVID-19 over the months to come, we are at the very same time building the kind of capacity and resilience that's gonna be necessary on a going forward basis. And that's just a down payment on a larger uh, strategy that the US is going to undertake, including by the way, a substantial sum of money that was allocated beyond that $4 billion in the American Rescue Plan. And fingers crossed that uh, is finally passed this coming week uh, and becomes law, at which point we will have more resources to bring to bear, not just by ourselves, but in concert with like-minded allies and partners around the world to try to truly produce global solutions to what are these global challenges. Well, that actually fits right into my next question because nearly every report agreed that America can't solve any of these global challenges alone, that we need to renew both our own diplomatic capacity at State Department, USAID, the other international agencies, and strengthen alliances and partners. There were, you won't be surprised, a lot of calls for reforms, both inside our own structures as well as within our partners, and you know from your own work in prior administrations, you worked on the first QDDR, that that's hard, these reforms. So I'd be interested in what you see are some of the first steps that we need to do to renew and shape our alliances, our partnerships, going back to the themes we were talking about to deliver for the American people, and how do we make sure our partners deliver for us? So both parts, what do we have to do and what do we need to make sure our partners to do so we get this ecosystem right and, and since we can't do these alone? So the first thing uh, is, of course, um, getting the aspects of our own house in order, which means uh, increasing the level of transparency and accountability in our development dollars, making sure that we are setting clear objectives and then measuring ourselves in terms of progress against those objectives. These were things that over the course of the Obama administration, we were making progress on with still a lot of work to do. Over the last four years, there's been a, reason, a fair amount of atrophy uh, on the, the underlying kind of components of what's required to really truly deliver effective development outcomes. And so we have repair work to do and then additional steps to take to make sure on the both on transparency and accountability, um, the, the US government is really living up to the highest standards. And then in terms of our work with the rest of the world, First, it's about institutional reform. Uh, we rejoined the WHO, which was absolutely the right thing to do because being a part of and helping shape the work of the World Health Organization is critical to our own health security. Um, but we also said the WHO needs reforms. And, and just watching the way that this origins investigation has unfolded uh, and, and the real concerns we have over the extent to which the WHO has been able to deliver uh, an effective product uh, is an example of the work that needs to be done to ensure that it is um, standing up to any form of intimidation and coercion and really truly delivering uh, against its mission and mandate. And then beyond that, 
um, we need to be thinking about all of the creative new partnerships, public-private partnerships, um, the, the work that we do with NGOs, so that we take uh, this patchwork, this sort of vari variable geometry of institutions, whether it's Gavi or the Global Fund, or the more informal coalition that came together to fight Ebola, uh, and turn it into something that really uh, reduces gaps and overlaps and, and um, redundancies, and is truly streamlined to be as effective as possible going forward. Recognizing it's not all gonna be formal legal institutions, that there will be coalitions of the capable, um, but also trying to find ways forward that are not just ad hoc, um, don't require us to build the whole you know, airplane anew every time we want to fly it. Uh, and that's that's hard institutional that work that needs to be done with the United States playing a constructive consultative role with other key partners. Well, I think that's relevant for my next question. Uh, many of the reports highlighted the growing and protracted humanitarian crisis around the world. They are citing more than 235 million people who will need humanitarian assistance this year. It's estimated to be a 40% increase from 2020. And as you know better than anyone, so many of these, these crises are driven from political conflicts outside their borders. We could spend literally an hour or more on each one, Yemen, Syria, Venezuela, the list goes on and on. And so I'm interested in your take of how the US helps break both the log jam to resolve these decade long crises while also mobilizing the world to address these growing humanitarian needs that literally are taking place every moment of the day. Yeah, I mean, I think your, your question frames it up perfectly. We need to be operating in parallel on two tracks at once. One track is to directly address the humanitarian crisis, working with organizations like UNHCR and the International Organization for Migration, working with the World Food Program, working with UN agencies across the board, as well as direct assistance being delivered by USAID and, and our bilateral partners. And, and that's true uh, with respect to um, uh, providing food in the face of famine, providing health and medical care, uh, urgently in the face of uh, massive refugee flows, finding ways to uh, educate the children who have spent much of their lives displaced from the communities in which they were born. All of that has to operate and it has to operate in a more intensive, more resource-focused, more urgent way. But it won't be enough because at the end of the day, uh, that is a, a massive pulsating symptom of an underlying disease, which is the disease of conflict and instability um, that has to be addressed through diplomatic means. Uh, one of the things we're working very hard at right now is to try to get a ceasefire in the conflict in Yemen, which has been the worst humanitarian catastrophe uh, of recent times, and uh, where only by ending the conflict can we truly address the underlying humanitarian uh, situation there. So the United States has stepped up. We've appointed a special envoy, uh, Tim Lenderking. He's been involved actively in the region. He's out there right now uh, working closely with the United Nations and others to try to bring about a reduction in violence in that conflict. Across the Middle East, our goal has been to de-escalate tensions, to de-escalate violence, to create circumstances where we're alleviating some of the, uh, the humanitarian uh, fallout uh, from these proxy wars that have ravaged the Middle East over the course of the past two decades. And in a place like Venezuela, our view is that we can only effectively succeed in addressing the humanitarian situation if there is a multilateral effort that is undertaken. If we are working closely with the countries of the region, uh, if the United States is not going in to dictate terms, but rather is going in as part of a broader chorus of voices to help bring about an effective political transition uh, a new set of elections and an opportunity for that country to move forward in doing so, taking some of the pressure off all of the neighbors who are enduring this, this awful uh, refugee crisis uh, with the spillover from Venezuela's border. So that's just some of the, the work that we're doing at the moment. Some of our highest, prof, uh, highest priority diplomatic work is not something you see on the front pages of newspapers every day, 
but that we are plugging away at these things because we recognize the human cost of the continuing turmoil, instability, political chaos, uh, and outright conflict across the various uh, crises you've described and others as well. Absolutely. You know, uh, the report uh, also speaking, picking up on these, it did a, has a lot of them focused, as you can imagine, on the climate agenda. And there were clearly differences, you know, particularly on how the United States can reduce its greenhouse gas emissions, no surprise. Well, where there was a widespread consensus, regardless of the cause, was how do you address the global impact of climate change that's exacerbating so many of these other challenges, ones that we just talked about, migration, famine, disproportionality impact of those particularly in the developing world. And I was curious about how among the many priorities of climate change, how important is it to invest in building the resilience to mitigate against these challenges, as I said, that are exacerbating so many of these others that we've been talking about? You know, it's it's critical. It's vital. In fact, I think if you sat Secretary Kerry down here or Gina McCarthy or any of the other folks in our administration um, who have the climate portfolio, um, or you sat me or Tony Blinken or Lloyd Austin down where climate has to be central to the broader national security enterprise in the United States, every one of us would tell you the same thing, which is that mitigation and adaptation are both uh fundamentally essential to solving the problem. We've got to bring down dramatically the overall emissions globally. And we also have to flow resources, massive amounts of resources to help countries be able to effectively adapt to and build resilience toward the climate impacts that uh, are hitting poor, less developed countries the hardest. Uh, and you've, you've named, you've gone down the list, uh, whether it's drought, uh, or it's the impact of uh, extreme weather events, uh, or it's famine, or it's um, other drivers that cause migration, displacement, conflict, scarcity, want. Um, it, you know, the whole notion behind Paris and the, the buildup to both the Climate Leader Summit that President Biden will be hosting on Earth Day and ultimately COP26 in Glasgow this fall is all about extracting commitments from every country, including the United States, to go further on mitigation, but also extracting commitments from every country, including the United States, to go further on financing the kinds of investments that are going to be required uh, to help countries adapt and build resilience towards climate change. And by the way, this is not just a developing world issue. The United States needs to be investing massively in resilience. And a big part of what President Biden um, we'll be talking about in the months and years ahead are the kinds of investments we need to make uh, as we watch wildfires and storms and hurricanes and floods across uh, every region of the United States uh, to be able to protect our workers, our farmers, our businesses, our communities, our families. So this is a challenge that we have to take on right here at home and one that we need to contribute to helping address and meet head on around the world. Uh, there was a lot of folks that were, a lot of these reports that talked about the rise and concern of the rise of authoritarianism and reflecting on the fact that for the 15th year in a row, Freedom House talked about the decline of democracy. What is your take and your thoughts about what we need to do to address this concern? You know, it's interesting. In his speech at the Munich Security Conference a couple of weeks ago, President Biden um, sort of paused at a certain moment and had a section of that speech devoted to a pretty simple proposition, which is that people are going to look back on the 2020s as a time of real contest between democracies and autocracies. Uh, at a time when those leaders of autocratic regimes are saying, hey, democracy doesn't work anymore. It's not up to the challenges that we face, the crises that we face in this world. Autocracy, dictatorship is simply a better model for the 21st century. And this, he said, he said in his speech, and he believes passionately, has got to be the moment where democracies step up and prove that they can deliver 
for their citizens and for the greater good of humanity to solve the problems that we have. And he has abiding confidence that we are capable of doing that if we do the work. And so doing the work means first and foremost, uh, pulling together um, behind a common vision of the values that underpin our democracy, uh, the institutions that uphold our democracy, uh, reinforcing those through uh, a genuinely renewed spirit of bipartisanship, which the president both practices and preaches every day. Um, and then it's about moving government to solve the problems of ordinary citizens. Uh, that's what was at the heart of the American Rescue Plan. It's what is at the heart of the rest of his agenda. And then it's about democracies pulling together to show that good government, transparency, accountability, anti-corruption, and respecting the human rights and human dignity of all people everywhere, this is a better model for uh, leading to progress and prosperity uh, and respect for all citizens. And that's just work that is going to be central to everything that we do, both in domestic policy and in foreign policy in the years ahead. And it's not some sort of old Cold War mindset. It is about a modern, forward-looking vision of how you produce a better world, what it takes, what kind of model it's going to take to serve the interests of our people and people everywhere. And President Biden is just, this, this, this is a core foundational commitment of his and a centerpiece of his foreign policy. Jake, the, the last of our six topics that was, that was in every one of these reports, though there were difference of views, was countering economic global competition, particularly with China. And there were, again, a wide range of views everything from another Cold War with China to a two-track uh, approach between competition and cooperation. But what they all said is we need to up our game. America should not leave the playing field alone out there. Can you comment on your approach to the economic global competition? I think it begins at home with the investments that we need to make in the sources of our own strength. Uh, investing in our innovation, in our industrial base, in our workforce, in our infrastructure, in our care economy, uh, in everything we need to do to make sure that the American people are given the tools that they need to succeed and thrive in the global economy. Because if they have those tools, they will win any competition against anyone. And so those far-reaching, forward-looking investments are core not just to the president's domestic agenda, but core to his entire theory of foreign policy and national security. So that's job one. And that is why you'll hear me as national security advisor spend more time talking about and being a cheerleader for domestic and economic policy than many of my predecessors, because I personally view it as so central to our success uh, in terms of achieving our national interests uh, in foreign policy and national security. But that alone is not enough. Just investing is not enough. There are other steps we need to take as well, including being very clear about the kinds of abuses uh, in the international economic space that we will not tolerate, and then building a coalition of like-minded countries to push back against those abuses, whether it is illegal subsidies or the theft of intellectual property or uh, the predatory role of state-owned enterprises that distort markets, or the use of forced labor uh, for, you know, in supply chains that, that extend to products used in the United States. Across all of these dimensions and more, the United States has to be prepared to define, identify, and combat uh, those kinds of practices. And that's not about creating rival blocks. It's not about a new Cold War. It's about a hard-headed and clear-eyed assessment of where other countries are taking steps and China's um, you know, primary among them to undermine the rules of the road in the international economy to their benefit and to the detriment of others, including American workers and businesses, and to push back hard against that. And the United States will do that under the Biden administration, and we will not do it by ourselves. We will do it working together with like-minded economies who are facing similar challenges and similar abuses, and 
very much like us would would like to have a way uh, to sharpen the choice for China as it takes these its decisions about how it's going to operate in the years ahead. So let me ask you two last quick questions. Uh, today's International Women's Day. Um, and as I said at the top of the program, it is a it, it coincides at this report and reports and it's a it's it's a moment to where so many people that are at part of this that are tuning in today are part of the celebration of success in investing in women. But it's also this moment of heartbreak of how the last year has disproportionately impacted women around the globe. And I want to give you just a, a moment to reflect on what International Women's Day you think we have to do going forward, given what we just saw happen over the last year. Well, you know, President Biden signed an executive order today establishing a gender policy council at the White House. And one part of that is the national security and foreign policy dimension. Uh, it, we are, the National Security Council is a part of the gender policy council. Um, we will put every policy across the board through the prism of uh, women's rights, women's political participation, women peace and security, women's economic opportunities, because this is not some niche issue. This is literally half the world's population. And if we do not make the investments necessary for half the world's population to succeed and to thrive, none of us will. It is that elemental. And the fact is that it's not enough just to have a set of programs or a defined set of policies. It needs to be infused in everything across the board. And what we know from the research is that when women are able to participate equally in the labor force, when women are able, able to participate equally in the political process, when women are able to have a seat at the table in conflict scenarios, um, the outcomes are so much better, more sustainable and more effective than when they are excluded or demeaned or diminished. And we have never fully lived up to that almost anywhere in the world, certainly not here in the United States. Um, and certainly not even here inside the White House where there is always more work to do. But it is something that um, senior leaders uh, across this administration and this government are going to be focused on, not just today on International Women's Day, but every day going forward because of its centrality to our fund, not just our values, but our fundamental national interests. So speaking of more work to do, my final question. This week marks one year since much of the world shut down, where WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic. Uh, in every one of these reports and in the last 30 minutes of our conversation, we've been talking about the need for America to engage in the world because it's in America's interest. This roadmap shows there is a policy consensus to, to strengthen diplomacy tools, development tools, which are central tenet to your strategy. So my question, Jake, is do you think we, and what by the we, I'm saying the administration, Capitol Hill, the American people, have the political will to make the investments, resources to meet these growing needs and to stick with it? I do, I actually do. Um, you know, I, uh, have my moments of optimism and pessimism about a lot of things in the world. But I think we are at a moment right now where the level of momentum behind making the investments we need to make in diplomacy and development is greater than I've seen in a long time. It's bipartisan. It's shared by the administration and the Congress and uh, the, the NGO community, as you've said. And it converges around, uh, you know, some big areas where, uh, including the, the, the global public health area, um, where I really believe that we will have the opportunity, and we just saw it with the money in the American Rescue Plan for global health. I think we'll see it in the FY22 budget. I think we'll see it in the appropriations that we get out of the House and Senate in the months ahead. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that any of us can sit back and just wait for that to happen. We all have to work together to advocate, to put our shoulder to the wheel uh, to make the case, and then ultimately to hold ourselves accountable that if we do get those resources, we spend them wisely and well, and we tell our story well, 
so that we keep getting them in the years ahead uh, and don't squander this opportunity that I think has truly presented itself. That's our common charge. That's what we all have to do together. We're committed uh, from the Biden administration, from this White House to doing our part. We know you guys are committed to doing yours as you've proven a uh, year in and year out. And uh, let's, um, let's all work together on this, this common set of opportunities to take on this enormous set of challenges uh, that, that we can overcome if we, if we do it together. Jake, we're very grateful for your time today, for your leadership, for your commitment to make sure there's the resources and they're done well, and for your commitment to do it in a bipartisan way, because that's, this is for the American people. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And to everybody, thank you for joining us today for what's been a terrific conversation. Our panel earlier, I hope you will take a moment to read Report on Reports, again, at our website at usglc.org backslash roadmap. Share it with your friends. Follow us on Twitter at USGLC and stay part of the conversation. It's an important conversation. We need to make sure that if we're going to deliver for the American people, it means staying engaged in the global arena. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for joining us.